So, wonderful good morning, dear Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues. It's uh, my pleasure um, to give the introductory lecture um, this morning on this um, excellent conference. And before actually starting, I would like to congratulate um, Professor Knecht and the organizing team for putting together what at least seems to me to become a very um, excellent and impressive uh, meeting with uh, excellent speakers and hopefully vivid um, discussions um, on those panel. And uh, secondly, I'm um, pleased and feel privileged um, to be invited to contribute um, to this meeting with um, some ideas, some concepts from a biological and also from a pharmaceutical perspective. So therefore, um, what I will do instead of deeping, um, or diving too much into the details of molecular pathways, I just hope to touch some stimulating and interesting points over the next um, 20 to 25 minutes, which then give rise to a lot of questions and hopefully lively discussions. So what I'm trying to do um, is to start instead with complicated charts about the interconnection and networks of oncogenic signaling pathways, just from the other side, from the end, um, typically. And this, uh, by talking about recently proved targeted therapies in cancer, and then there are two aspects I would like to bring across um, in my presentation. There are two aspects. The need for targeted drugs, and I will refer to that, obviously, with the EGFR, PR3, kinesif, and I will also mention some others. And then kind of pointing out another aspect, uh, and this is the targeted application of those targeted drugs. Um, and this then goes into the field of translational medicine, personalized medicine, or what I would call the search for predictive markers. And then hopefully there will be some preliminary conclusions because, as I heard, the real conclusions then come from the panel discussion. Um, this is then where the real statements will be made. Okay, so let's get started. So if we just look um, at the FDA approvals um, for anti-cancer agents um, over the last um, year, and actually, although I've been told not to go too much in that direction, I will, otherwise I cannot read it, so hopefully it doesn't cause any trouble for the for the cameras. If we look which drugs have been approved over the last uh, about 12 months, so then there are actually only four drugs approved. And even without going into the details which drugs those are, I think um, this number certainly could and should be higher. So um, the productivity, despite enormous efforts, is not as strong as I think all of us would like to see it. And uh, we will come to some potential reasons for that. Actually, two out of those um, drugs I will mention although only briefly, this is on the one hand lapatinib, or as it is now called Ticurb, which is an EGFR inhibitor, and then the uh, Temsodolimus, uh, the Tori cell, which is an mTOR inhibitor, um, but none of them has been yet approved um, for um, lung cancer uh, or for head and neck cancer, um, but I think they may have some potential in there. Okay, and then with regard to the head and neck cancer, basically there is here, um, under the expanded indications, one agent which is also in use um, for head and neck cancer. And if we go back 12 months into the year 2006, then we can see um, that at least then we come to the point that uh, we had here a variety of, of compounds, actually basically twice the number. And here we had then also HPV recombinant vaccine, which I think in the future may become interesting also for head and neck cancers. I think there are interesting clinical data um, about the role of HPV. Um, in head and neck cancer. Um, and then, of course, we come um, then also to the, now I have to see, where is it? Um, here we have the uh, panmitumab. And then if we look here for the expanded indication for the first time, we see cetuximab or abitux um, being approved for the treatment of head and neck cancer. And then we have also here um, the doxotaxel, uh, so taxotere, um, which has been also um, approved for the treatment of and neck cancer. Now, what is interesting, and just by chance, if you look at those two different um, agents and you talk about targeted therapies, typically most people in the audience would say that only one of those is a targeted therapy. Um, only the, here, I think there would be full agreement and consent. Here, probably p uh, people for the doxotaxel would say that's more of a chemotherapy, although if you look in detail at it, the affinity and the selectivity of this compound for its target tubulin is just as high as uh, that of the Abitux for the EGFR 
So it's interesting um, about the, the connotation of targeted therapies. Anyway, so EGFR receptors clearly have their role in head and neck cancer, and therefore as a very superficial um, introduction to that. Um, I've just uh, drawn here a cartoon. So the HER, as it is also human epidermal growth factor receptor family, um, consists of four members, and you see there are several different names. Either it's kind of HER1 to 4, but HER1 is the EGFR receptor. HER2 is called in rats mu, because that was an oncogene, or it's also called ERB2. Um, and this is kind of the target of the drug Herceptin, which uh, probably all of you know. And I think those two family members, they have been the target of uh, many therapeutic um, approaches so far in breast cancer and here in lung and in, in breast cancer so far, um, and also in head and neck cancer and in colon. Um, but there are two more members which so far have been received less attention, but they are certainly also very important, and certainly this, the HER3, is very important because although it was considered for a long time to be more or less irrelevant because it has no enzymatic activity. It has no kinase activity. Recent data has shown that by forming heterodimers, particularly with the HER1, it can dramatically influence and modify the signal transduction downstream of HER1, and actually HER3 has been recently involved to be a major factor in causing resistance to treatment with EGFR receptor inhibitors. Okay, and then here, a very schematic view. So what happens actually if those um, HER receptors um, then dimerize, and uh, those always have to dimerize, but they can form either homodimers or they can form certain heterodimers. And then there are different signaling pathways downstream of that, and I will refer later to it for the time being. I think it's sufficient just to say there are classical, well-known pathways with regard to cancer, like the ras raf pathway or the PI3 kinase P10 AKT pathway. So if we look then about preclinical and clinical um, yeah, development candidates for targeting the EGFR receptor uh, in the head and neck cancer, then we see there is a whole plethora of compounds, and these comprise antibodies, this is kind of the light gray colored compounds, as well as um, small molecules. And I think these are the original terms. I think this is the Erbitux, um, that's from the Imclone, um, the original configuration. And here we have the um, IRESA, the, uh, here we have the Tassiva compound, and this is Ticurb um, lapatinib. Um, and we see this one already has approved, has been approved in head and neck cancer. There's a whole plethora, and um, if there's interest, we can discuss then later on about subtle differences between that. Now, is the EGFR the EGF receptor, is this a homogeneous target? Does it just matter whether it's there or whether it's not there to be then to represent a valid target for treatment with such compounds? And the answer is no, it is not. Because also in the molecule itself, there is a significant amount of heterogeneity. And this refers to the fact that many mutations have been found in the EGFR receptor. Now, most of this work so far has been done in lung cancer, in NSCLC. There is less evidence um, for these mutations in uh, head and neck cancer, but I'm not sure whether this will hold up once uh, we look more carefully um, into head and neck cancer and for these mutations. And then you can see that we have two types of mutations. We have those mutations that cause drug resistance to certain treatments. And on the other hand, we have mutations that are associated with drug sensitivity. And to be honest, in the very early days of developing those EGF receptor inhibitors, this all was unknown. So Iresa and Tassiva, which were the front runners in that regard, were developed without any of this knowledge, which turned out to be crucial, because what has been shown, at least in lung cancer, is the fact that those small molecule drugs will work preferentially in tumors that have these types of mutations. And this is, without going into the details, this is the classical mutation which confers sensitivity to um, IRESA and, and to TASIVA. Now, the interesting aspect of that is that this is prevalent in very specific subtypes of non-small cell lung cancer. So this mutation is typically not found in cancers induced by smoking or by those 
NSCLC cancers that are induced in the Western world, in Caucasian populations. But this population is prevalent in women of Asian ethnic origin who are non-smokers. And this shows you um, how important it is to understand more, not only to treat a disease as just one common entity based on classical pathology, but really to look deeper into individual patient groups or subgroups in order to understand the efficacy of those drugs. But then as a result, after initial response um, of those tumors harboring these mutations to those molecules, many tumors become resistant. And this is then due to the fact to secondary mutations that occur, which then cause resistance against um, the so-called first-generation inhibitors of the EGFR receptor. And then again, this shows we really have to look um, at the tumor on a molecular level. And um, as a result, we have now at this point in time basically three different types of EGFR receptor um, inhibitors on a functional level. And these are the small molecule inhibitors that just classically target the EGF receptor 1, and that are dependent basically on the presence, at least for non-small cell lung cancer, on the presence of those mutations. It may be that in head and neck cancer, they may also work in those tumors overexpressing the EGF receptor. Then we have the tie curb, the lapatinib, which is an irreversible inhibitor, which now is also um, able to block her, um, the um, EGF receptors 1 and 2, so also the ERP2, and therefore is approved actually for the treatment of a septin refractory tumor. And there are now new agents already in advanced clinical development, which are not listed here in, in phase 2 and will enter phase 3 probably in, in short time, which are now able to overcome resistance also to those first-generation inhibitors, but also being active in the other um, uh, cancers with the um, resisting causing mutation. And then we have the antibodies, which so far we believe basically to be independent, to act independent of those mutations in the EGF receptor, but just kind of being active if the receptor is present. By the way, I'll show you in the, in the end that this is no longer true. Okay, so much to the good side. So we see that sensitivity is uh, dependent on the kinase mutations, but also resistance can be caused by that. But there are many more mechanisms that can cause resistance to the EGFR that are not directly related to the EGFR. And on the other hand, this shows clearly that we need um, other therapeutic approaches um, in order to overcome the uh, resistance induced by one or several of these mechanisms. And this is typically um, um, employing other ways to target the cancer. And this leads me back and brings me back um, to this um, cartoon here. And I will now um, mention a couple of interesting targets that may act cooperatively or even synergistically, at least on a preclinical level, with inhibition of the EGFR and may also act independent of the EGFR in those cancers. Now, one cascade very well known is the ras raf mec erk kinase cascade. And of course, you know that um, RAS probably together uh, with uh, uh, P10 and the PI3 kinase particularly here, I think those two are probably the most often oncogenically activated genes in cancers. And therefore, this is a very interesting cascade. And of course, there have been many attempts to block and interfere with oncogenically activated RAS. However, so far, all attempts have been basically unsuccessful. Farnesyl transferase inhibitors may be the most well-known and prominent, but I think we have not been able to target um, this molecule. So therefore, the focus has been going downstream of that. And there we have the RAF kinase, although this is a very prominent oncogene because it's mutated in probably, let's say, half or even more than 50% of all melanomas. So there's one particular mutation in this kinase um, which um, um, can drive the growth of human melanomas. And then in contrast, we have here another kinase that's called MEC. And also, also being very important, this is not typically mutated in cancers, but it's being activated as a result of increased signal input from here. And I think now recently, um, the interest um, of developing inhibitors has been focused on these two um, molecules. And I will show that in a second. And then in parallel, we have another pathway. And this is the PI3 kinase pathway. And this is here a dimeric molecule. Um, and the P10 pathway. And I think the P10 is a tumor suppressor gene that um, causes um, the um, Patsega syndrome. 
if knocked out, it's a phosphatase. And here we have, in parallel, the oncogenic kinase, the PI3 kinase.